But we'll start with Sir Crispin Tickell, and I was very, very pleased that Sir Crispin was able to join us. Crispin, um, well, he knows world politics, I should think, at least as well as almost anybody else in the world. Him and he's worked all over the place. He was, for example, British ambassador to the United Nations in Mexico and a few other places like that. He's become um, a world authority, really, on environmental matters, particularly on climate change, which embraces agriculture. And if I may say so, he, like me, is old enough to remember that the present economic model is not the only one there is. Even in this country, we don't have to talk about Marx and all that stuff. Even in this country, we, we used to do things very differently within the context of what is called capitalism. And we could do things very differently, again, within the context of what is called capitalism. And I'm going to ask Crispin, if you would, to speak to this for 15 minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, to, to, uh, to uh, our host today, I say thank you for your kind remarks about me. I do assure you all that I'm human, um, and also, and also, more important, that I agree with almost everything he said. Now, economics. The title of my few minutes I'm going to talk to you about is the economics of agriculture. But I, what I want to do really is to take the, the general stance and look at economics in general. Because I think it's an overdue debate that is really beginning in this country in quite an important way, in which the models that have been current in the last few years are now being seen in a new and rather less favourable light. Indeed, we are beginning to think again. And the idea is that I want to just go through some of the general side before you come down to the more specific issues you'll hear about later. There was a rather interesting headline in the Financial Times on the 28th of December, which was, this is the editorial, Capitalism is dead, long live capitalism. Well, the essential message in that leading article was the need to look again at everything and see that, yes, there were good things about capitalism, but by God, there were some very unsatisfactory ones as well. And we need, indeed, to work out a new way of looking at things. And that coincides rather well with the recent work that's been going on um, about the way in which our little animal species, humans, have been changing the face of the earth, which is why is that some geologists are now talking about, in the same way they talked about the Holocene or they talked about the Pleistocene, they're now beginning to talk about the Anthropocene, or that element in the history of the earth when humans began to change it, its land, its sea, and its air, in a way that geologists could later track as having this extraordinary impact. And so it's the Anthropocene that is really very important. And this represents a combination of things. It means changes in the chemistry of the air, and you all heard a lot about climate change. It means changes in the chemistry of the oceans, already acidification is having big effects. And it means changes in the surface of the land, where we have, where, which is our prime subject today. And in that way, we are seeing a degradation, an exhaustion of materials, and a new world that I think our, even our grandparents wouldn't very easily recognize. Now, in all this, the role of governments to enable their populations to feed is absolutely critical. I think that people have rightly said that governments have simply got to be able to make sure that there is food in their countries and there is energy in their countries, the two absolutely prime requirements. And as recent events have shown, where there is a food shortage, and there have been several recently, probably a product of climate change, uh, the social and political situation has changed radically. There have been food riots all over the world, and at the moment we're seeing what I prefer to call not so much climate change as climate destabilization, in which you're getting unexpected storms, unexpected droughts, unexpected floods, unexpected <coughs> creatures everywhere. Now, Curiously enough, in the last 30 years, we've seen that people have begun to think of agriculture not, as in the past, as a very special form of economic activity, but just an economic activity like other forms of economic activity, and thereby driven by markets. 
And many now believe that the emphasis on industrial agriculture is a feature of that. In other words, we've gone away from thinking that agriculture is special to saying agriculture is just business like any other form of business. And indeed, that is what our debate today is about because I believe that to be wrong. You know that Colin Tudge thinks it's wrong and I think many of you here already think it doesn't quite work like that. So, the Anthropocene, a new epoch, a new and vital <coughs> element in it, the production of food, all that is changing before our eyes. Now, of course, governments uh, must make use of market forces, but only in the sense of a framework <coughs> of the public interest. Market forces, of course, are very important. I should underline the fact that there never has been a free market anywhere in the history of the world, and there never will be. All of them are subject to regulation, whether it's voluntary or whether it is by rules and regulations and parliaments is another matter. But there is no such thing as a free market. Markets can be a useful, but, uh, useful tool, but are a dangerous master. And as has been well said, markets are marvellous at setting prices, but incapable of recognising costs. And we must recognise that, there is the, 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 that this particular element of food is absolutely critical. And of course, there's a close relationship between food policy and energy policy. Anything that may be said about food is also applicable substantially to uh, energy. Now on the economics, Every time a politician rises to his feet, and I think most people in the Treasury will argue that we need growth, but they don't ever tell us what growth actually means. And I always think when I hear a politician saying that on the stage, I always want to say to him, excuse me, what do you mean by growth? Because many of them, many of them will not have the slightest idea. It may just mean producing lots of things that are absolutely useless and nobody wants, but if so, it must be encouraged because we need growth. You have gross national product and gross domestic product, which even the economist Keynes <coughs> was very suspicious about in the past. And you have all this business of linked to um, growth and uh, the other word which is much used, well, GNP, GDP is much used. All these things suggest a kind of economy. The only solution to our current problems is growth, but nobody tells you what growth means. Of course, there is growing debate on working out the principles of what the Chinese call clean green growth, where they try to take account of externalities and try to recalculate it all, but that has not so far really become part of the official establishment view. Now there's nothing wrong with governments setting incentives and disincentives. You'd think somehow that was a criminal act, but governments have to set incentives and disincentives, and I think it's very reasonable that they should do so. But we have at the moment a very distorted picture when you come to agriculture, and indeed, you can argue that in Europe, in the United States, where there are crazy subsidies, it is a real mess. And one of the things we need to do is not so much introduce competition and market forces, it's just to clear up the mess, which is very visible to us all. And of course, that equally applies to aid policy towards the third world, when we, we want to encourage countries in rece receipt of aid to supply us with uh, agriculture, what they really should be doing. And I speak as a former permanent secretary of our aid program, what we should be able to do is they're helping them to feed themselves and find out how best to do so. Again, another very important element is ecology. You've heard a word about eco-services. We are wholly dependent upon the good health of the natural world in which we live. Um, I, it, I always think it very important that there are ten times as many bacteria as there are body cells in each of our bodies. We are part of the natural world and the minute we think that the good health of the natural world can somehow be sacrificed on grounds of, uh, of business or anything else by making an appalling mistake. And we need to value the natural world and the eco-services it provides in a coherent fashion. And it is something which, as I've said, is already very difficult. Of course, we need to work out the consequences for agriculture of such international variations as supply of water, supply of energy, and, of course, pollution, something that hasn't yet been properly done. We need to regulate more strictly the environmental effects of agriculture, including soil degradation, um, uses of energy, chemicals and, uh, and, and uh, fertilizers. You probably have seen the recent articles in the learned press about the effects of our using nitrogen. 
and its long-term effects on the ecosystems of the whole planet. And of course, the increasing demand for meat is also having a considerable effect right through agriculture. So we need to recognize the special place and the vulnerability of cities, where now more than half the world now lives. Cities are like, uh, cities are like organisms. They take in food and materials and they emit waste. And again, that hasn't yet properly worked out. We need to accept that the biggest environmental hazard of all, the biggest of all, is probably human proliferation. We are multiplying at an incredible rate. And you've already had this referred to. But I can think of when people say to you, which is the worst environmental problem? It's not pollution, it's not this, it's not that. It's the fact that humans as a species are multiplying at an intolerable rate. And as you've heard, one billion of us at the moment are not properly fed. Now, in the long term, what are we going to do? Well, we've got to recognize the, the shift of political and economic power from, from uh, west to east. You've heard about that. I've been in China twice in the last three months, and I've heard about the efforts of the Chinese to find new ways of coping with some of the problems I've mentioned as features of the Anthropocene. They're doing their best, but of course it is extremely difficult. Um, we have to work out on our side the contribution of agriculture to, such, to other major environmental problems. I mean, the amount, for example, that we contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. In America, I believe it's something like 10% comes from agriculture. Interestingly <coughs> enough, the Australian Ca Carbon Farming Initiative, have you heard of that? The Australian Carbon Farming Initiative is now the first piece of national legislation which is trying to measure the effects of, uh, of agriculture on the environment and above all for greenhouse gases. But there's a host of possibilities which we can be discussed during this conference. I'm not going to go into them now about we could, what we could do to cope with the problems of the Anthropocene. All I can say is that thinking differently, thinking differently about economics is an absolutely primary one, because when we think differently, then we can begin to do differently. And so I simply say to you today, think differently, above all, about economics, and then we can think a bit about agriculture, how we're to be fed, how we're to get our, where we're to get our energy from, and how indeed our society is to be healthy, wealthy and wise. Thank you. Thank you.